She Open the Door is pleased to sponsor this event as part of Women's History Month. The She Open the Door initiative, which began with a historic conference in New York City in 2018, aims to enlighten, educate, elevate, and to empower self-identifying Columbia women across the university. Much like the brilliant work Ms. Shapiro has discovered about some amazing historical women figures, She Opened the Door was founded and named after the discovery of a painting in the historic Columbia archives. That painting was a Winifred Edgerton Merle, the first woman to receive a degree from Columbia University and whose bravery and commitment towards education opened the door for women to gain access to Columbia's graduate and professional schools at a time when co-education for women was under heavy debate. After today's program, we will have an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question and we will get to as many as we can today. I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Lori Gwen Shapiro. She is a biographer, journalist, filmmaker, and NYU journalism professor who has written for many publications, including The New Yorker and The New York Times. As a director, she has won the Independent Spirit Award and was nominated for an Emmy. Also, her unlikely The New Yorker story, The Improbable Journey of Dorothy Parker's Ashes, won a 2021 GANYC Apple Award for Best Article, and her New York Times profile of a living World War II pilot who received the 2022 Silurian Press Club Gold Medallion as Best Profile. Her first nonfiction book, The Stowaway, was an indie next selection and national bestseller. And Viking Books will publish her narrative nonfiction tale of Amelia Earhart's marriage upcoming in 2024. I am so pleased to welcome Lori to Columbia at Home. Enjoy. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here, and I want to thank everyone uh, from uh, the Columbia Alumni Association, and she opened the door for inviting me, particularly Francine Glick. Um, I am going to talk casually to you. Um, this is a lunchtime chat, and I believe that a casual approach actually works really best when you're telling a story, and I'm going to be talking mostly about print stories, but I also have a film background. And a lot of how I've now I work as a journalist um, is actually heavily influenced by my documentary making. And also my former secret life as a chiclet novelist, which I brought from my youth. Um, I'm going to start with the number one uh, method that I actually use to get a story and that editors uh, particularly appreciate. And that word is access. Um, if you take one thing from this discussion, I hope you will remember the word access. Because why should you tell the story? This is often a question that editors ask, that uh, even um, people buying films ask. Um, and access doesn't have to be a celebrity so access doesn't have to be a war story. Access can actually start at home and you could have a fascinating um, piece that could be nationally published or locally published. And how do we figure out what our access is? We start with who we are, who, what is our cultural background? Um, I, for one, am a native New Yorker. That very much defines me. I'm also um, a Lower East Sider. I know, I understand that immigrant experience, and I also understand that the Lower East Side doesn't look what it looks like. Often you see people writing about the past, and if you've been down here, you know exactly that that's not the way the Lower East Side, it's no more tenements uh, per se. It's really like, you know, ridiculous prices, and I have a deep understanding of the Lower East Side. My family has been here for over a hundred years. I also went to public high school and I went to a uh, private school. Uh, um, I went to Stuyvesant High School, which allowed the access for a story that just got published today in the New York Times and will be the great read. Actually, it's it, the great read at 12 o'clock uh, during this seminar. And that is a story about Malachi McCourt, who was uh, had announced on Facebook, he's my Facebook friend, that he was dying. 
And I realized immediately that I had tremendous access to Malachi McCourt. First of all, I went to Stuyvesant and Frank McCourt was my teacher and I met him, his brother back in the 80s. I was involved with very low budget documentaries in the 90s. And he's a family friend. He even did my mother's Jewish um, uh, funeral and turned it into an Irish wake. And so normally you would think that the Times doesn't want to have someone who knows someone. Where is the journalistic wall? But in this case, I was very upfront about my access in my pitch. And I said, I can get a very intimate, emotional story that other people will miss. And that is the story that is published today and will be in the Sunday Times and is actually the great read today. So that just started with basic access. Who do I know? Not everyone has to be famous. I actually had a very old father and many people here will have an older relative that, and that story can be interesting on itself. Um, one of my students at NYU didn't think she had any access and started telling me about her grandmother who immigrated from Jamaica in 1950. And we're working together on a story that's going to be marvelous. And, you know, she basically interviewed her grandmother. And one of the ways you can interview people that are in your family, uh, even if you don't get it published, it's great to have family archives, is just to simply use your phone. You don't need fancy equipment. Don't get nervous about it. Just you have a if you have voice mess, uh, messages on your phone, and we almost all have that built into our smart smartphones. Just hit record. And one thing you should do when you're writing um, a history of someone is to make sure you have an audio recording. Some people use the reporter notebooks, but I don't find that's very helpful right now. I find that having an audio backup is what every editor wants you to have, but it will also allow you to transcribe. And I like to transcribe, uh, you know, myself just to some rereading the words, but there are many different uh, programs that can be used like Otter, which you can instantly transcribe. But I highly recommend uh, thinking about your family. Um, the other thing, that is interesting about access is, and this is particularly, I know this is a co-ed audience right now, but this is uh, geared uh, for women networking. It actually changes how you get paid for a story uh, for either it's a film or a book or an article. Um, even though we would like to think we live in somewhat enlightened times, you'd be shocked how much uh, men still will often get more than a woman. Uh, in, in a book deal, it's just the way it is. And one of the ways you can end that discrepancy is get astounding access to a story. Um, and another way that you can think about access is, it could also be language. I, I, if you speak Spanish, for example, or French, you might have access to stories that other people don't understand. So that is the word that I really want everyone to write down and focus. I'm also going to talk about how you choose a story. I, I was just talking to my editor today about my Malachi McCord story, and he said that he often gets pitched on themes that everyone is thinking about and not characters. And choosing a good story um, and this, we're not talking about necessarily news reporting. We're talking about feature writing or feature documentaries. Um, but choosing a good story to tell often inv involves a person. And you can tell a story through a person. You can tell the themes of what you want. If you're writing a, um, a more politically themed or socially themed story, you can still choose a person to, ex to show what you're talking about, and people will be much more emotionally connected to the story. And I'm going to give an example of a documentary that I worked on in the 90s. I was not the director. I was working in publicity, but it was um, about uh, women who uh, were under attack in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in, in, instead of just talking about the whole situation, they put two women in the room to talk to each other who had both been through the same thing. And that really popped the story. Instead of trying to take on the entire war, it was about people. And it, the, the, the themes and the, the tragedies of what was going on in war crimes came through. 
So that's something that I really would like everybody to think about. We're going to also be taking questions uh, at the halfway mark of this um, seminar. And anything that you want to ask, I certainly will go back to. I also want to talk about how getting a story and the way that some people are doing it in 2023 and why you should not do it that way, which is no, try not to do your interviews and your reporting from your house. It's very convenient to do a Zoom interview. It's very inconvenient to get someone on the phone, but go back to the old ways because you're going to get the, the better article by leaving your house, by going to the person that you're um, interviewing. And sometimes it's a matter of money, but there's creative ways to get around it. I mean, I have taken a, a mega bus from, from, from New York to Columbus, Ohio, when I was broke a few years ago and got a story that, that, that uh, was published. Um, and I think that you should talk, think about if you're younger, can you sleep on someone's couch? Can you go to, you know, instead of Zooming Boston, go to Boston, get your story if, it, if that's where it is set. Um, one of the reasons you want to do that is that people will share more with you in person and you'll also get a sense of place, which a lot of people don't realize should be part of your story. Where are you? Where are we? Are we you're just is it just someone talking? Are they in the room? Are they in a city? Are they in a town? And an example of a story that that popped open for me like that was a story about Alice D. Rivera that I I was one of my first stories I wrote for the New Yorker, and they didn't give me a lot of money. I was a freelancer, but they thought they thought they would take a risk at uh, for, on me. And Alice D. Rivera was a 14-year-old girl or 13-year-old girl who sued Stuyvesant in 1960s to open up uh, uh, the high school to everyone, gender desegregation. And um, she was sort of a, a Paul Bunyan character. I went to Stuyvesant High School 10 years later, and she never went to Stuyvesant. And so nobody really knew where she was. And I used my access as a Stuyvesant graduate with the alumni office. And I asked them, is there any way we can get a phone number for Alice D. Rivera? And I did get a number. I contacted her. She was in rural Maine, which was not great for my story because I'm a native New Yorker, as I said. And I'm also one of the few people I know that still doesn't have a driver's license. And I thought, how am I going to get to rural Maine? But I wanted to show the staff of the New Yorker that I was going to get off of my couch. I was going to go get the story like a like a, a champion reporter. And I literally took the bus to Portland and then I Ubered, which is not that expensive once you get out of New York. I Ubered about 25 minutes to the house and she was so delighted. She couldn't believe that I came to Maine where she was a rural, she was a uh, doctor. Um, she was in her 60s now. And as I was talking to her, I said, do you happen to have any archives uh, in your house or anything from that time? And all of a sudden she said, well, you know what? I was talking in newspapers in the 60s how much I liked Jimi Hendrix. And Jimi Hendrix contacted me. And all of a sudden, she brought out letters from Jimi Hendrix and Electric Ladyland uh, signed by Jimi Hendrix. And all of a sudden, my story took on a much warmer tone with details that I would have never gotten on the phone or never even gotten on Zoom. She felt comfortable with me. She, you know, she took about 25 minutes to find these albums. She would never have done that on a Zoom call. And the bonus of doing that work was that the New Yorker was so impressed with what I was doing. First, they doubled my pay because they didn't want me to have be out of pocket. I was losing money on the story, but then I was able to write more stories for them. Uh, my most popular story for The New Yorker was about Dorothy Parker's ashes. And I heard about this story from a friend. I uh, had to keep it quiet for a year, but she was actually buried uh, in a long, complicated tale in Baltimore. And he, this man who was the president of the uh, Dorothy Parker Society, had read my story about Alice D. Rivera and wanted to know if I wanted to help bring Dorothy Parker back to New York 
to Woodlawn Cemetery. So my good reporting got me access to the story. Um, I was ne I've never, I'm never assigned stories. I find my own stories. I make my own luck. I'm not on staff. I'm a freelancer. So freelancers, you have to make your own luck. And I went to Baltimore. I had a Dorothy Parker on my lap. <laughs> going back. So, so these details give you a much richer story. And I'm, try to imagine doing this, um, you know, a phone call conversation with the person uh, from the Dorothy Parker. What was that like? Be The reporter being on the train is actually going to pop the story. Being in Baltimore, the weather, this, the, you know, it was actually a really rainy day. It took hours to get Dorothy Parker out of the ground. It was drilling. I mean, we were there for hours before she was, she was supposed to come out, out of the ground right away. And all of that rich detail can go into your article because um, you've made the effort to go there. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about, hold on one second. Okay, one of the things that I try to do, and I talked about the fact that I've also been a documentary feature director and producer, is that I remember that when I'm doing a feature story or when I'm, you know, I don't think of it as a news story. And it's really important to understand the difference. A news story has that where, why, what, when, everything we know from, from high school right up in the front. But a feature story can often start with a quote or anything to draw you in. It is. It should be fun or startling or a wow lead, but it definitely doesn't have to have, you know, the everything that you've learned from a news uh, story in the beginning. You, what you want is people to continue to read. That is the most important thing about a feature story. And you often can think of it almost like a feature documentary. Um, I'm sure many of you have watched HBO documentaries. Some of them can be about changing the world, but you know, not every documentary has to be about changing the world. It could be about an interesting character portrayal. But if your story has plot, and a character. You can also have dialogue, which is something that people don't often think about putting in the stories. You make it into almost like a feature uh, film unfolding on the page. And the, if you think of it that way, and I've also written novels in my past, you know, the pacing of a story is much more important than the reporting uh, coming out. You know, you it's okay to also be funny in a serious story. If you read my story later about Malachi McCourt, it starts out pretty grim. He he is about he's gone into hospice care, but it actually ends up much more entertaining than that because he gets kicked out of hospice care. And the comedy of Malachi McCourt comes out. He's still alive and he's still cracking jokes. And that you can go very dark in a story if you also in, in, to include comic elements. So when you're thinking of a, a good feature story, think about a great book that you've read. You know, think about a great movie or a documentary that you've seen. Can you sort of tell it in that cinematic style? And I'm talking about features, but I also write nonfiction books. Um, and that's the same thing. You, you want to have um, in a nonfiction book, there is a new genre, not that new, but relatively new called narrative nonfiction. And that is written more cinematically. You know, in the past, we've had traditional biographies. Now, I'm currently writing a book about Amelia Earhart and her marriage, and I am not doing a traditional biography. I'm doing a narrative nonfiction. It doesn't start with her birth. That's not where I begin my story. I start where she meets her husband. Uh, that's where, where, you know, that moment, that's where that story begins. And many people will know of someone like Eric Larson, uh, David Grant, Patrick Radden Keefe. These are the great, uh, Susan Orlean. These are the great people that um, are doing narrative nonfiction books. Many of them write for the New Yorker. So if you're interested in writing a larger book, you should study the people that are doing it. That is something that I did. I follow them on Twitter. I go to their events. 
I, I, when I started writing nonfiction, I was actually older. I had come out of fiction writing and um, come out of documentaries. And I am now 56. And I started at 50 years old <laughs> to start not writing nonfiction and have actually just dedicated myself to understanding the craft. And that's something that um, I also want to talk about, which is that because you found a good story doesn't mean you're going to get into the Times or the New Yorker right away. You really want to not blow your shot. You might have a great connection. Maybe you know someone who knows someone, but don't use that until you know that you've mastered the ability to tell a good story. And one of the nicest things you can do is, is just practice. Find outlets that are desperate for good stories. Local papers uh, um, will definitely want uh, stories. Uh, in New York City, there's the West Side Rag, there's a the Low Down, which is a lo Lower East Side, a local paper. But I teach my students, you know, that that are all over the United States that, you know, a story that is outside of New York is perfectly wonderful. Um, and often the place would be the nearest big city. So, for example, a, a story that um, uh, one of my students was writing about uh, a local story in her town instead of trying to get it into the New York Times, we got it into the Sacramento Bee because it was it was a large paper. It's a significant clip, but it made more sense to go there. And as you want to increase your ability to sell stories, you want to build clips. And you don't want to be that person that goes to the top editor and you don't have the clips and you don't have the experience. And you don't have to have the best clips in the world, but they have to be able to look at something. And you wanna pick two or three of your best clips. So the opportunity to use your local papers or local radio stations even have um, uh, online, like NPR often has just an online piece, which is not on the air. Um, the dot com is the secret friend of every journalist uh, or filmmaker. It's much easier. I'm gonna make a full confession. My Dorothy Parker story was never in the magazine. It was only at newyorker.com. Everyone comes up to me and says, I love your Dorothy Parker. I read it in the magazine. It's impossible. You never read it in the magazine. <laughs> but it got a lot of people don't remember anymore what was in the magazine, what's online. It's sure it's really nice to have something in print. It pays more to be honest, to get a print publication. It's about twice the amount you get for web, but you get in the door with the online editors. And many newspapers and magazines have an um, that are have print, have an online editor and a print editor. And you learn who to pitch. You don't always pitch the editor in chief. Sometimes you wanna pitch a, a younger editor who might be looking for a good story. Um, and that's something that we can talk about uh, in questions if, you know, how do you find the right person to pitch? But I wanna focus on having you find the right story. Um, I'm gonna also talk about another form of access. Again, that is my key word for everybody for this is access because editors love true access. I, I gave an assignment to my class. It sounds a little bit dopey, but everybody can do it tonight. And I'm sure this is gonna help, is to take a, a piece of paper or your computer and write down 10 things that you love. Sounds really simple, right? But not a, not a person. 10 things you love that are not a person. This is an exercise I, uh, um, I'm offering because what it's gonna do is it's going to have you list things that you love that you might be passionate about. It could be something like Lucky Charm cereal, or it could be you know the sunset in Malaysia. Um, but what do you love? Again, not a person. The reason I'm telling you this is because when you look down the list, you're gonna see that you have um, access through passion. If you're pas passionate about it, it's gonna come across in your writing. If you're, if you're just doing, if you're guessing what you think people might be interested in, you're probably missing the boat. If you have a real love of something, that's gonna come across in your pitch as well. So that is a, another form of access is uh, passion. And I am going to say one other, another thing is um, 
I talked before about access to people that you know in your family, like a, a grandparent. Old people are a fantastic way to start telling stories. People, I mean, even Malachi McCourt today is 91. I've written a story about a 97 year old man that I met on the street in New York that was in the New York Times. And that's the piece that won the award of the, the pilot who was from World War II, who helped a Jewish pilot who helped invent Christmas, uh, artificial Christmas trees uh, for America. And that was our Christmas story. That was not a Jewish story. That was run as the Christmas story. But I got that story, A, because I walk all the time. I get access by walking. But B, because I eavesdrop um, and I overheard him talking in front of the Eleanor Roosevelt statue uh, about being in World War II. And my eyes just lit up and I realized I got to talk to this guy. And I had a card. I gave it to him and he was excited to talk to me. But I will say, if any of the listeners of this seminar have anyone who is in any way connected to World War II, whether a woman uh, involved um, you know, in the WAC or any kind of soldier or whatever, please stop everything you're doing. Do that story first. First of all, there's a, tr I mean, if you care about this, is actually a really big market for it, but it's actually a really good deed to be doing. These people are dying every single day and getting those stories down are very important. And again, you don't need a film crew to do this. You can just use your phone and record them. And it's really wonderful when you talk to older people, they really feel that their lives mean something. But older people in general are great story ideas. Again, they're people which is pops a story. But one thing that my mother taught me is that often women are ignored once they get past a certain age and they make wonderful stories if, you, if you're if you open to a woman's life. Um, you can find uh, a party where there'll be like a couple of older women in an, uh, you know, or a conference and nobody's talking to them. Everybody's going around with their cards. Instead of talking to the youngest person in the room, try to talk to the oldest person in the room because ask them about their life. And I'm telling you, that's going to be a better person to connect with. Um, one party trick that I have when I'm trying to find a story when I go to a party is I often seek out the oldest person in the room and, and talk, talk to them. But I often ask people, what's your greatest story? What's your best story? And people love to, it's like an automatic party breaker, a, 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 a mood changer, and people light up and they say, oh, I have a great story. I've also had people tell me about their parents' story. And one story that I got was um, by a, a, a young man who said, well, I don't have a great story, but my father-in-law has a great story. And his father-in-law was the guy who collected all the abstract expressionist art. His name was Ben Heller. Um, before I went into the MoMA and I thought he was dead. He said, oh no, he's alive in his nineties. And I texted someone at the New York Magazine and I had an answer within 30 seconds. Oh my God, give me that story. And he was telling me the story of how he had uh, all the Jackson Pollocks and Willem de Kooning's in his apartment. They called it the Frick of the Upper West Side and 40,000 people went through the apartment until the MoMA realized they had missed the big paintings. Um, and that's a great story. But I also, because I was talking directly with the gentleman, he had slides of the paintings in his apartment. And that was something that I pitched to my editor, like, hey, not only do I have the guy, but I've got incredible access to this artwork that no one has ever seen of blue poles and number one from you know uh, Pollock and Mark Rothko's on a walls and on kitchens in an apartment. And you know all these paintings and you can find this article on New York Magazine. So when you pitch a story, think about also, is there good artwork that you can offer access to? Is there good photographs or things that no one has ever seen? Um, that is something that I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm just going to to uh, talk about, a little bit about Columbia University and Barnard, which have incredible archives. If you're alumni, um, many other universities are wonderful sources. But 
uh, Columbia has something called the Oral Archive, which I used for not only for my Amelia Earhart book, but for my last book, The Stowaway, where the stowaway who jumped in, into the uh, Hudson River and went to Antarctica after he came back um, was enrolled in Columbia. Um, but Amelia Earhart didn't sit down and do an, uh, an oral history at Columbia, but other people did. And then they may have mentioned Amelia Earhart a few times, but ask your librarians, you know, can we do a search on this? Don't try to do your research from home. Go to the library. I beg you, get off the couches. I know we're doing this as a webinar, but most librarians are your secret weapons on research. Yes, we have things like newspapers.com and ProQuest, and it's very easy to Google things online and then look into these new newspaper archives. But I'm telling you that uh, people have, uh, libraries put up about 2% of what they actually have. They can't put up everything online, it's impossible. And the way to find out what is actually there is to engage with your librarian. One of the things I did is I, I know that Amelia Earhart, for example, uh, took classes at Barnard as well as Columbia. And I checked with Barnard and they they didn't think they had anything about her, but I went in, I, I went through the papers and they did. And there was like, you know, it's not, nothing game changing, but it gives a little bit of rich detail. Um, I often use um, uh, the New York Public Library which many of you have and other big, big libraries around the country. Many of you can do research at home. The online uh, places I like are newspapers.com, which is really easy, but ProQuest is a very good site uh, for, for uh, historical archives. Um, I'm gonna give you a little secret, which is one of my favorite tips, which is there is a site called Archive Grid, which basically links all the major uh, archives around the world. And you can put in your person or your subject and you'll be shocked that there might be like, you know, a couple of letters uh, in Texas. There might be a couple of letters in Canada, but you'll see everywhere in the world that has archives. They might not tell you what's there, but it will tell you that they will have a letter. And I think that that's something that really helped my writing is I would see that there were archives on Amelia Earhart in places that I wouldn't expect. Um, and then you can get in contact with a librarian and see if if it's one if it's one letter, maybe you don't need to get have a trip out there, but you can get a copy of the letter very easily. So use those kind of resources. But don't forget that a librarian is actually your your very, very best source. And I think that we're going to be doing um, questions now. Am I am I correct? Yes. And Lori, are you ready for your first question? Or any kind of question, I'm happy to answer. So the first question is from Carolyn and Tracy, who both asked, can you give us a list of writers that you follow? I know you mentioned a few earlier. If we can maybe just go over that list again and add in some new ones as well. Okay, the people that I mentioned earlier, my my heroes include Patrick Radden Keefe, who I think is the be one of the best people working right now, um, Susan Orlean, uh, David Gran, who has a new book coming out this spring. He's these are phenomenal storytellers. Um, I also I also um, uh, I guess Eric Larson is someone that is sort of a master at the larger storytelling. Um, I also follow um, her profiles. Um, uh, does anyone you know uh, Taffy Broder Acker, who's really um, amazing? Um, there's different kinds of stories where, a pro, um, you know, I've been talking about features, but sometimes a profile can have storytelling elements on, on it. Um, I, do, I do attend, um, a lot of lectures. I live in New York City and I, the, a lot of lectures are free. And here's a secret. Columbia University has incredible lectures. Barnard has incredible lectures. They are open to the public. Um, and NYU's lectures are open to the public. Check your university and see who's speaking in the, uh, you know, in, on site and you, there's no reason why you shouldn't be allowed to come in. I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize the access for outsiders. 
Okay, next question is from Farah, and it is, will you ever write up a series of your adventures with Uber drivers from around the world into a book? <laughs> we went to Stuyvesant together. Just, I know who that is. Um, I tend to talk to everyone. I tend, this is something that I think everyone who's, if you're, if you're not talking to people, I'm not sure why you want to be a reporter. Honestly, you can do archival reporting, but you still should be talking to people. I used to be very shy and I got over that, but I've gotten, I would say 90% of my stories from just talking to people, from asking questions, not that I'm looking for them. I mean, even, um, uh, I mean, as I said, the pilot story, which is my most, had the most accolades, um, was just from uh, like eavesdropping. I during the pandemic, I took a lot of long walks in different neighborhoods of New York and would meet new people. Um, it was a way of keeping healthy, but also keeping my brain going. And um, I try to walk a lot, but when I take an Uber, particularly in New York City, um, people are from all over the world. They're from Tibet. They're from South America. They're from, you know, many countries in Africa. And nobody talks to the drivers. And they're fascinating. Many of the Uber drivers have PhDs or have other lives going. And it's just an, an incredible way to hear about different places. Um, I've, I've learned a lot about uh, West Africa and I've even eaten with my drivers. We've, we've put the meter off and we've driven up and we've had, so it's just a really good habit to get in the habit of asking questions, not about yourself, but who are you? You know, what is your best story? Where did you grow up? What, I mean, you could do as simple as, oh, what, um, you're Tibetan. Are there any good re Tibetan restaurants in, the, in New York that you recommend? Those kind of things will open up conversations. And I think that kind of follows into our next question, which is about how to find the right person to pitch. That's an, a fascinating question. Okay, so one of the things is, this is, I mean, this is why it's good to be in some uh, organization like she opened the door, okay? Because it is possible to pitch editors randomly, but it doesn't usually work, or agents even. It doesn't usually work. It's ugly, but true. And sometimes just trying to figure out if anyone has a connection to someone. Um, and I give my connections. I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not getting 5,000 requests, but I'm pretty generous. <laughs> but I also um, have been, you know, people help, you know, share back. I do not think of fellow writers as my competition. That's something that really I share as much as I can and people share with me. And as far as getting a book agent, often when an, a, a fellow writer is vouching for um, a writer, um, they go to straight to the top of the pile. The same thing with a magazine article. You know, one of the things if you're in a networking group is to find out who's actually writing for an organization. Not everyone's going to be able to do this. If if then you want to look to see who the features editor is, you can find a lot of things on LinkedIn, but you can find on Twitter. One secret about editors, a lot of editors will respond to direct messages on Twitter faster than they will to email. A lot of people have open messages. Um, if you don't know who to ask, try to think of someone in your network that might. You certainly. I mean, we don't have, if anyone, I mean, we could put my email in here. Well, we have it up there. If you, you're trying, you have a, a, a perfect story. You're trying to think who might be the right editor. You certainly can contact me. And because we're in this conference, I will do that. But again, um, don't try to pitch over your skill level because it's not going to work. And you could have gone to that person slightly later. If you, if you're new to storytelling, start smaller start with local publications start with online magazines um and and build clips the first thing any sort of editor is going to say is can i see some of your clips they really don't care um what your resume looks like that's really not what any editor is looking at they are looking at your clips and if you have lousy clips you're not going to get anywhere but if you have somebody to vouch for you um you're going to get faster 
get somewhere faster. It's sad, but true. And I try not to be a gatekeeper. There's a lot, a lot of people use that word. And I think that's good karma because somebody, you know, opened the gate for me. I even, the name of this organization, she opened the door. And also one thing I try to do is I realize that a lot of women are ignored, especially when they get to the middle age. And I try to really help get women to visualize what they want to do, what the, what the projects um, would be best for them. And one of the things I always start with is, what are you passionate about? Never try to write what you think you should be writing about. Always try to choose topics that you're passionate about, and that's going to come across in your pitch. Um, and it will make somebody want to connect with their editor and say, hey, this person really knows this story. I think you want to talk to that person. Great. The um, next one is a little bit of a technical question is what sure. device do you use to record all of your interviews? Okay. This is a really easy question. I, 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 I used, to, I went to a B and H photo and I got this really fancy schmancy recorded for a hundred dollars and it was just so complicated and it, it was great. And then I realized that my phone, as I was saying before, is the simplest thing. Uh, it works just as fine. I just hit audio record. Everyone has this built into their phone. I guarantee you, you have it in your phone. You don't need, if you don't know it. And I always transcribe my uh, interviews, but it's the second reason to do this is because it backs you up. Uh, if somebody is um, saying you're lying, you're saving your butt, you know? Um, I don't get asked for my audio recordings all the time, but once in a while I do. And I have everything backed up, but it's so easy to do it. One of the nice things about using your phone is it, it lights up when you start recording, but like about 20 seconds in, it turns to black and the um, person that you're talking to just forgets it. Now, when you're doing a, a documentary interview, it's different. You know, you have the camera and that's, you know, and I've done many of those. Um, it's a slight, this, people are a little bit edgier when they're do, doing video uh, interviews, but if you're just doing a, a article, use your phone. Um, the other thing about that is that uh, it, it really will force you to look at what was said. You can, you don't even have to take notes if you're you recording your interview because you, all your notes are being taken for you, if that makes any sense. I know that some people like to use a reporter's notebook. I don't do that. That's but everyone has their own style. But I just like I don't I just like to have the way we're having this conversation today, a casual communication. If I was relying on PowerPoint, it would be a lot stiffer. If I'm taking notes, I'm not giving eye contact to the person that I'm interviewing. Use your phone. One of the things that we've been hearing a lot about in the industry is the disruption of chat GPT. Lori, can you kind of give a little bit of your background about that, how you feel about it, where you think it's going uh, in your industry? I don't think we should be, I don't think we should be afraid of it. I think we should be aware of it. Uh, I know at NYU, we've been talking about it. Um, I tell my students, you know, there's a lot of, for anyone that doesn't know this, there's a lot of ways to detect uh, AI writing. So don't try it and think you're going to get away with it. But the one thing is that people, it gives wrong information um, as well, but the way to use, I think it's going to become more and more accurate as we go along, but the way to use it is to brainstorm, is to, you know, to, to use it as a tool, the way that we use Google. I'm old enough to remember the day that Google caught on. It was startling. It was just like a different world. This is sort of what this new uh, technology feels like to me. But we don't really think about Google taking over the world right now. We just use Google as part of our everyday writing. That is the way you should be using this. Uh, you know, um, I'll give you an example. One of my students um, was wondering what questions she should ask about um, an article she's writing about a beauty, a beauty article. And I said, why don't you put what you want to ask into AI and see what questions they can say. Can you give me 10 questions to ask my subject? And she explained as much as she could and 10 questions came up and not all of them are great, but five of them were pretty good. And you know, when you interview that person with those questions, that's not plagiarizing. 
You've just, you're just asking questions. So you're kind of using it as a tool rather than relying on it for writing. And I don't think we should be afraid of it. I'm not afraid of Google. And I think everybody was afraid of Google when it first came out. Now we know that your book is coming out next year on Amelia. Is there any little sneak peeks or tidbits you can tell us um, about it before it is published? Well, I will tell you that um, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. That <laughs> and I'm not writing about Amelia Earhart's uh, death. I'm writing about her alive. I'm writing about her as a woman. And I think that's one of the things that we I realized is that w there are a lot of women even that are icons and we we don't allow them to have flaws. We don't allow them to have prejudices. We don't have allow them to have anything wrong with them. And I don't think that is correct. And then the other thing is I'm writing this uh, 20 years after the last major book on Amelia Earhart and the world has changed to a certain extent. I mean, we have post Me Too, we're post Black Lives Matters. And you realize that, you know, I'm not writing about um, uh, the Black aviator, you know, aviate, we, we, the word aviatrix is not really used anymore, but it used to be used. But I, I want to contextualize. People have been written out of history and I want to put them back in. My story is still about Amelia Earhart, right? But I'm I'm actually a little wiser because the authors that came before me didn't go through Me Too movement. They didn't go through Black Lives Matters. I know more uh, that you know as a person, I'm aware of what what has been left out. Also, the thing that I will say is the gold standard for any kind of biography or nonfiction book for real fact based writing are letters. If you can find letters that is what you're going for because that's pretty hard to to say this didn't happen and so looking through archives is a really wonderful way many of amelia earhart's archives were already used a million times but i never ever rely on a biographer before me to tell me what's in a in an archive you have to go do your original research often a mistake will be copied and passed down from one biographer to the next. And you can tell they never even went to the original archives. I found so many mistakes from previous books just by looking at the original material. And I also saw, uh, tried to find new archives that hadn't been tapped before. And I will say that I did find a lot of letters that people aren't aware of. So that's pretty exciting. And you get much more, much closer to a person uh, when you're seeing private communication, and not just letters by Amelia, but by other people that that knew Amelia Earhart very well, um, and also I also understood um, racism um, and how it was used in the past, uh, which is something that it's very. I mean, one of the things we're we're seeing today is Asian hate. And I was realizing that a lot of the Japanese capture theories, for example, came out of World War II, uh, people that, you know, milita military historians. And there's a lot of racism inherent in the idea that Amelia was captured to, um, and taken to Japan. And that's something that um, you kind of have to be away from a military perspective to see, and a little bit younger, perhaps. Um, many of the former historians that were trying to tackle this um, were in World War II and where there was propaganda against uh, Asians. Uh, and, you know, Amelia Earhart disappeared in 1937 and no one thought anything of it. And it suddenly here's the story changes when we're in World War II. So start to think about that. I mean, that's not my story, but you start to you start to put together the clues um, and you also are um, every generation is going to have a different take on a, a, a classic story like Amelia Earhart. I'm putting what I think is the proper uh, information. I'm also leading, have a very hefty bibliography so people can fact check me. But I'm sure that in 20 years, there might be more letters that are discovered or there might be more information that's revealed and you do the best that you can with what you you have access to. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so you've mentioned um, seeking out kind of that older generation um, to interview. What if someone is still alive, 
but you think that their story is important or of interest to a newspaper, who would you go about contacting to have someone interview them? I was, well, um, is this, if this is a question, if somebody wants to not write the story themselves, um, is try to think about what is the appeal of this person. For example, um, in my student who's working about a story about her her Jamaican grandmother's immigration, um, to, to you know, this is something that is of interest where there's a lot of Jamaican Im immigrants, um, you know, Florida or New York. I mean, you're not going to necessarily pitch that story, um, you know, everywhere. Um, is there a community that that person was living in? Um, I wrote a story about my uncle who was, I had uh, older parents and my uncle was in World War II and was a ski trooper in the 10th mountain, but he was Jewish. That was a very elite, uh, a classist um, group. A lot of people started the ski industry from there, but I pitched that to the forward to the Jewish uh, forward because it was about a Jewish ski trooper in World War II. So think about the angles of the person. What is their ethnic background? What is their gender orientation? I mean, what what is the, is it a funny story? Is it a sad story? And, you know, possibly reach out to a, a, a journalist. But the first thing you might want to do if is older is just to record the story yourself. Because somebody can, people can die like that. I tell people all the time, just get a story down yourself. My aunt, who's going to be 100 this year, I did a just record her. She's not famous in any way, but she's seen a lot and she still had her, her mind, you know, per, in perfect order. I did a story about her 99 years and what she remembered that went very viral. And it was just her talking about the history, but I put in markers that everyone knows, like JFK being assassinated, World War II, um, Vietnam. And she was able to put her own life, but I was grading in things that people could latch on to. So that would be my advice is before you even ask anyone else to do it, do it yourself, because at the very least, you'll have it for children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews. And one thing you can do is also go to the library and ask for an oral historian. Many, many libraries um, in around the country, around the world have oral historians who are happy to come into communities and record the people that are in that community. But do reach out to me. If you have an older person, that's my specialty. Some people call me the old Jewish man whisperer. <laughs> I can get every guy. If it's like, I mean, I get them to talk, but I, I do think, again, if anyone has a World War II veteran in any way, let's get those stories down and I'll be happy to help. Thank you, Lori. This is Lori's um, contact information, and I would like to introduce Francine Glick as our ALG co-chair. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Lori. It was absolutely fabulous. I mean, I had very high expectations and you certainly exceeded them. I'm not a writer, but I'm going to remember access, right? <laughs> um, before I forget, I just want you to know that this uh, session is going to be posted to the official Columbia Alumni Association YouTube, and you will get a link about that. Um, also, congratulations on your wonderful article in the New York Times today. I enjoyed reading it at breakfast. Um, I have a final question for you, Lori. Will you come back in person for a book signing next year? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm very excited about that, the Amelia Earhart book. Again, as I said, it's it's about her alive as a woman, which I think per perfectly fits the theme of this. And she's a Columbia alum. <laughs> well. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> thank you. So uh, we end on a positive note. So I want to thank all of the people who made this possible and all of you and the audience. And a big thank you to Lori. Um, have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity.